Great. Welcome everybody to the live stream. Today is going to be a pretty good day. It's uh, There's a lot of uh, bullish sentiment out there, which is a little bit different from the last two days that we've seen, and we're going to talk all about it. So we'll take a look at first uh, Goldman Sachs. They've got a positive macro statement uh, from their head of investment strategy, which is a quick video. We'll go over that real, real fast. Also, Goldman Sachs and FTX. Uh, looks like they're going to do a partnership. And they've come a long way from saying that crypto was even an asset class, or really have they? We'll take a look at exactly what this partnership might mean. Also, on the horizon. Uh, Jerome Powell uh, is actually speaking today and he's raising, and he's talking about raising rates, looking at the history that is Volcker, which is a former Fed chairman. And lastly, there's a great lesson to be learned today of uh, time in the market is more important than timing. We'll take a look at 0x and what's going on with them and Coinbase and very end, we'll do five questions in five minutes. So let's do a quick market recap, see where we are. If you're here for the live stream, thanks for stopping by, I really appreciate it. Just know if you're watching the replay, timestamps underneath, shouldn't take too long, try to get in and out and here we go. So first things first, let's take a look at the market. Looking pretty good. And we've been getting uh, our teeth kicked in recently, but there's some good news on the horizon. And that's the thing about crypto markets or any markets. Some days there's a lot of bearish news and I cover that. And I don't think people like to hear bearish news, but I have to be honest. And those are just the things that I see. And then time goes on and there's some more, there's some bullish news out there. Now, does all bullish news equate to a massive run up in the market? No. And we can see that. Now, if this is 2017, probably, or 2020, yeah, probably, but everything's different now. So we've got some good news. Also, Tesla earnings came out and uh, they had talked about in the earnings report that they hadn't sold one Bitcoin. So that's pretty positive. Good for Tesla. And here's how things are going in the market. I don't have to tell you if you know this, but it's interesting just for uh, for clarity. Bitcoin's up 2%. It's pretty good. 42,000. Ethereum up 1.4%. Solana, Terra, Cardano, Polkadot. Everything's up. But remember, we're looking at the, at the grand scheme of things. Look at like the 12-day of the seven day, Terra's up massively, 12 and a half percent. Bitcoin's act actually up even more than that. So things are looking pretty good. So what does that mean? Well, really what it means is down to this is that there's more buyers than sellers. That's really what it comes down to. And we can see that uh, there is some bullish sentiment, especially for Tron, crazy, 14%. Who'd have thunk it? Uh, let's see, Uniswap, 11% for Theta Network, great. It's pretty good. Theta is one of those that just you've been holding forever, hasn't done anything. Or maybe that's just me. And that's what's going on in the market. So let's just jump into today's top stories, which is the first one goes with this. And I like to hear some positive sentiments in the macro because you can go anywhere and you can find some pretty, some pretty negative stuff. This was uh, the head of investment strategy uh, talking on uh, CNBC. Uh, squawk box. And what she talks about is about uh, inflation and how she believes that things aren't as bad as they seem, especially as we look out towards uh, inflation, supply chains, and uh, uh, also uh, unemployment rates, which I thought was a pretty good take on things as we move forward. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you take a listen to this. Let me share my, st share my screen so you can actually hear it. And this is about two minutes or so. So just take a listen. A little bit bullish, I think. <laughs> the, how much of your global perspective is based on inflation and, and central banks around the world and their reaction to it? We do believe that we, inflation, let's say in the U.S., for example, with the last print that we got for headline inflation around 8.5%, has most likely peaked. Obviously, we need to be appropriately humble. Nobody expected inflation numbers core or headline to get to these types of levels. But our view is when we look at the three key drivers of inflation, so we would have something like the supply-constrained uh, goods such as cars, for example, the vehicles used, the new electronics, et cetera. Then we have wages and we have housing. We do think that the uh, goods component inflation will come down, and we're going to see that coming down through the course, the rest of this year and the course of next year, and that's going to be significant. Uh, we also think that 
there is a chance, not a high chance, but a pretty good chance that wage inflation is going to stabilize around these levels for a little while longer, but then start declining as well. Because, in fact, we're beginning to see an improvement, obviously, in labor force participation. And what's remarkable is we have seen an amazing increase in the unretirement of people 55 years and older. In fact, the level of unretirement is above average, and you have about a million people out of that group that is unretired. And so when we're talking about the labor force participation, we have to recognize there's a lot of noise from the pandemic, and we need to see that clear up. And our view is that we are going to get more people, and so you're going to get uh, slow very gradual decrease in wage inflation. And then finally, housing and between higher home prices and basically higher mortgage rates with fixed mortgage rates at about 5%, you are going to see some pressure on demand as well. It's going to take a couple of years, but our view is generally inflation will be headed down. Uh, and that gives the Fed some flexibility. But across the board, we're seeing central banks raise rates and we're going to see balance sheet reduction. So there's a lot to unpack there. There's full, first of all, let's, let's just talk about uh, what she said. A lot of good points there. There's things, some things that are concerning. And one of the things she talks about was the labor force, especially the, the older labor force coming back in to work. Now, I don't know about you, but usually when, when you retire, sometimes you want to stay retired. And the reason why people are coming back is because they can't make ends meet because there's a, there's a pretty high inflation of goods and services and electricity. And we just see that all around the board. So there's that one piece. And then as far as like labor participation, yeah, the unemployment rate's not dramatically high. And that's actually one good indicator. But the question is, what kind of jobs are out there that people are, are getting? Are they good jobs? Are they bad jobs? Are they just not are just kind of in, in the middle of the road? I can say this, though. I see a lot of job openings everywhere, and it's like they just can't find the people. They can't find the people. That's not the greatest thing. But uh, as she talks about here, you know, hey, uh, inflation will come down. We'll see a little bit more positivity. But again, uh, <laughs> also that last piece where she said wage inflation, that's not the problem. I mean, wage inflation, that's not a, an awful thing. What's inflation is inflation across the board. So hopefully they can combat that. And we'll talk about Jerome Powell in a bit and how they plan to do those types of things. So let me just think about that in the comments section. Let's go on to the big news, which is Goldman Sachs and FTX. And this was a, it's an interesting story of the dynamics between Goldman Sachs and where they were just two years ago to where they're at right now. So here's what's going on in the world of crypto and Goldman. So Sam Bakeman fried gentleman up there, uh, founder and CEO of uh, the exchange FTX, Met Goldman Sachs CEO David Solomon in the Carib. It's, this is weird in the Caribbean to discuss potential collaborations between the two firms. So here's the thing: it's the 21st today. I'm pretty sure, yeah, 21st today. And I'm like, why is the head of Goldman Sachs in the Caribbean? Is this we're on vacation? Just bumped into each other? Well, not really. What's going on is that there's the uh, Crypto Bahamas put on by FTX and Salt, which is April 26th to the 29th of this year. So. When I look at this, I'm like, so you're telling me that the CEO just took a, took a trip to the Caribbean just to meet with Sam? I mean, there's worse places to meet him, but he went out of his way to meet him to talk about these things. The two chief executives discussed Goldman Sachs advising FTX, which was valued at $32 billion in January, on future funding rounds and taking a role in a potential initial public offering, IPO. That sounds familiar. An IPO where Goldman Sachs helped out somebody. Who else did they helped? Oh, yeah, they helped out uh, Coinbase. And uh, this was an article December 19th, 2020. Remember those days? Kind of odd. And it was reportedly picked to lead Coinbase APO. And I'm like, I wonder if that's true. So I took a look at the actual documentation from the SEC. And uh, I linked it in the description. You can find it, but it's kind of boring if you want to read it. But if you just do Command F and take a look, Goldman Sachs is all over the place. And what they do is just they are advising Goldman Sachs and Coil or Goldman Sachs and their market participants buy NASDAQ on its now on book viewer. Goldman Sachs notified NASDAQ their shares class A common stock. So they are the advisors of what everything went down for the Coinbase IPO, which, and honestly, the first day was great. But after that, not too awesome. However, that's not a bad thing. 
if they're advising him and going that way. So Solomon also offered Goldman Sachs advice to FTX in discussion with regulators in the U.S. FTX followed a proposal with the CFTC in March that would allow it to directly clear trades of its derivatives customers. Remember this word, derivatives customers. So I'm going to take you down a trip down memory lane for what was Coinbase IPO and Goldman Sachs and their nice little history. Uh, it's amazing how, how far Goldman Sachs has come. Uh, as far as like May 27, 2020, cryptos are not an asset class. They told all their customers in a meeting, like this isn't an asset class, nothing to see here. These aren't the droids that you're looking for. That type of thing. That is like Jedi mind trick stuff. And then all of a sudden, uh, they come here and they say, hey, you know what? Uh, this is on May 7, 2021. Just a year later, Goldman Sachs internal memo unveils no crypto, new crypto trading team. The bank informed its markets personnel that it's a newly created crypto desk had successfully traded two kinds of Bitcoin linked derivatives. Derivatives. Goldman said it also uh, seeking to broaden its market presence by selectively onboarding crypto trading institutions to expand offerings. So here's the thing. If you take a look at Goldman Sachs, it's not like they're huge believers into crypto and where crypto is going, but they are a big believer in money and profits. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's just the truth. And I think other institutions will start to look at this and go, hmm, there's a lot of money to be made. I mean, they already know it, let's be honest, but it's a risk on type of situation. But there's a lot of money to be made. And that's why I think in the long term, I've always said I've been a pretty bullish proponent of crypto. In the short term, that's where things get dicey. So right now, expect some pretty good volatility for the rest of this year. But I see these types of things as a bullish sentiment. So let me just think about that in the comment section. Let's move on to some news that uh, I don't know if this is priced or not. Uh, this is Jerome Powell speaks today. And here's what he's talking about as far as through history. So first up, this is, uh, did you know the Federal Reserve has their own Twitter account? I didn't know that until today. I thought, why would they be here? But here they are. They got a nice new blue check mark. Wish I had one of those. And it states uh, Chair Pro uh, Jerome Powell. Tempore Powell? Okay. Del what? Delivers welcome your remarks at the Volcker Alliance and Penn Institute for Urban Research Special Briefing. Watch live. You can watch it. It's kind of, kind of dry. And then I just thought this was funny. B Money has a nice little meme here. Fed prints 80% of all dollars in existence since 2020, causes record inflation, and of course, damn it, Russia. But what Volcker said in his opening statements was this. He said he recognized Paul Volcker, which is from the Volcker, which makes a lot of sense, saying Volcker left a strong legacy. He embodied the spirit of public service, keeping the core principle or mission at the center of his work. First of all, I'm always referencing this guy uh, in different segments that I do and other channels, Paul Volcker, if you don't know, American economist, served two terms as the 12th chair of the Federal Reserve from 79 to 87. He was nominated by Jimmy Carter, who was a Democrat, and then he was re-nominated by, by Reagan, which was, a, which was a huge Republican, which is no small feat here in the United States. Widely credited with having ended the high levels of inflation in the U.S. during the 70s and 80s. How did he do it? Here's how he did it. So during the 70s, monetary policy, the Federal Reserve Board, led by Volcker, were widely credited with curbing the rate of inflation. U.S. inflation peaked at 14.8% in March 1980. 14.8%, which is like, depending on what you believe. If you believe that 8% is, is the inflation rate or 20%, whichever. But back then, it was 14.8%. That's what they reported, probably higher. And it fell below 3% by 1983. So in just like a couple of 79, 80, like in two, three years, it went from 14.8 to 3%. How do you do it? So the Fed Reserve, led by Volcker, raised the, the Fed rates, which averaged 11% in 79, to a peak of 20% in June 81. The prime rate rose to 21.5% in 1981, which helped lead to the 1980 recession, in which the national unemployment rate rose to over 10%. So same thing here. If we have Volcker, and Jerome Powell is a pretty big fan of him. When he talks about these, these rate hikes, the question is how high can he go? And people will talk about, well, he can't go too high because it'll crash the economy. 
Well, Volker did it. And he's like, look, we got to go through the pain and we'll see how it goes out. I don't know if it's uh, exclusively priced in if he keeps going up. And if he keeps going up, then I think there will be some economic slowdown. And I will think that that, that will affect the stock market and NASDAQ and S&P 500 and all that stuff. And I do think that we are a little bit correlated, especially to NASDAQ. And if that happens, I don't see how uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum could hit all-time highs. It just really depends on how much they do. Time will tell. I can't really tell you. But I just found it interesting that Powell talks to the Institute, references Volcker, and now we've got him coming up in the next uh, month or so talking about more interest rate hikes. So expect that to happen. Let me know what you think about that in the comments. And then uh, let's take a look at some good news for the DCAers and people who get into it. This was a, it's a quick story. And it talks about 0x. And I don't know if you guys remember 0x, but it came out, I don't know, a couple of years ago. And uh, it was a big, it was a big token. And it was uh, pushed by Coinbase. And it kind of fell off. But it just soared 53% today, over the last couple of days, I should say, following the Coinbase NFT partnership. If you don't know, Coinbase is in the NFT game, which like everybody else is. I think that'll be big for them. Not these goofy NFTs, but with more utility type NFTs. Anyhow, so 0x token soars 53%. Here's the thing. You can't find that in the charts. You can't find that in TA. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this news just pretty much powered it all off. And there is something to be said for what happened here. And here was the tweet itself. Not a, not a big thing. It's just, we're proud of partnering with Coinbase to power their new social marketplace for NFTs. By using Xerox protocol, Coinbase provides better ways to discover, buy, sell, and connect NFTs at the lowest transaction cost for use. I think we can all get behind that if you've been using Ethereum. So this got me to thinking. If we went up 53%, now it's almost at a buck. How does that relate to time in the market versus timing the market? I mean, you can trade this all day long. Here it is in 20, geez, 24 hours. 70 cents, bring all the way to buck 15. Pretty good. I mean, in 24 hours. So the question then is, let's take a look at the max. And this is just one of those things where the same thing is what I did with Cardano, really, is that in 2017, 2018, when it was like 19 cents, of course, it spiked. Oh, wow. Just in 2018, just at the end of the bull run in 2017, because it didn't come out too long, too early after that or too late after that. And you can see it just kind of go down ranges and this, then it kind of, it's kind of funny. Like you buy it here, you're like, it's going to go up and then it keeps going down. It's going to go up and then it keeps going down. And then you're, then you're right here. This is essentially what I did in 2017. I just didn't really care. I'm like, I'm long-term bullish. I don't really care what's going on. Uh, like even today, I dollar cost average the same thing. Uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, Luna, and uh, Cosmos. It's that, it comes out every day. It doesn't matter to me, just automatic. And then here, uh, of course, is when every, no one wants to buy. And you can see it in like hodl waves over on uh, Ben's website. But if you just were dollar cost averaging right here, it's a pretty good day. Imagine if you could do that for, well, that's 2018, then 2019, then 2020, and a little bit of, so you might have got it at 60 cents, okay. And then 2020, and 21. And you would have been pretty happy right here during this big run up. Hopefully you took some profits, don't forget. Then it slams back down. But imagine all this time right here, time in the market is greater than timing the market. I can guarantee if you were dollar cost averaging right here, same thing that I did for years, you're feeling pretty relaxed. And I think that really is what it comes down to is why like people ask me like, well, Rob, you look pretty relaxed in, in crypto. It wasn't like that in 2017. It was a bundle of nerves because everything kept going down. But as time goes on, that's why I say, in the short term, it's not so big of a thing. It's interesting. It's interesting the thing that goes on a day to day. Sometimes it's bearish news, sometimes it's bullish news. I try to cover both because I feel like if I just give everybody hopium left and right, they'll be like, damn, this, Rob told me uh, all this good news and we didn't really talk about the bad stuff. And there it goes. I want you to be in here for the long term. That's why I talk about this stuff. I know some people don't like it, but it is what it is. So that's all we got. Let me know what you think about that in the comment section, time in versus timing. And then uh, we'll do five questions in five minutes. Also, just real quick, I'm going to be interviewing the president of uh, Fame MMA. And I've been talking about this for a while. They just went through their 
their funding, not the funding round, um, but and not even the token generation event, the TGLP through, through Tencent, meaning that this was just to get into the uh, initial sale and it already sold out in like five minutes. So I'm going to interview the president there. And these guys are doing a great job of, you, if you've heard about tokenizing your community, well, these guys have, they're, they already have a global reach through MMA and their, their fights, which they have influencers and celebrities and, and ex-UFC fighters. So they're tokenizing their community of millions. And I think it's going to be very big. And the token generation event uh, will be 29th when it goes live on some exchange. I'll let you know. But I'm going to be interviewing the president of the federation on Saturday. So if you got questions for him, put them in the comments below or also just follow me on Twitter and uh, tell me what you want to know about it because uh, I think it's going to be uh, pretty decent. Again, very risky. I talk about a damn DGen. So if you think it's like a guarantee, it's not. Everything's risky. Prepare to lose everything. Who knows? Anyhow, that's what's going on. And that's it. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. I'll consider subscribing. If you got to take off, take off. Go do your thing. Uh, we're going to do five questions in five minutes. Let's go from there. All right. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> and every time I ask for the questions, there's always a lag. So we'll just write and go from there. Comments. Apecoin. Yeah, I missed that one. I want to miss more too. Ooh, look at that. See, this is what I'm talking about. Have you heard of Alpine token? I haven't. It's the official token of Formula One. I have no idea if that's true. It doesn't really matter right now. Tokenizing. When I heard this, this comment from a bunch of other people, Raul Powell being one of them, tokenizing your community. And I was like, how, do you, how are you going to do that? And I see it now. I see it with with uh, Fame MMA, and if you do this with Formula One, you can tokenize the millions of people out there. What could the token do? Well, if you hold the token, it could give you discounts. It could give you NFTs of your favorite race car driver. You could stake it for more tokens. You could do a whole, and you could you know purchase uh, merchandise at a discounted rate. And what's great for them is that they reduce the cost of all the transaction fees of Visa, Mastercard, and everything else. So, like for me, I'm thinking about this. I'm like, this totally, this totally makes sense. And I think it's going to really ramp up. So. That is the proof my Joe was talking about my point. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. I appreciate it. There was this there was this great comment. Uh, follow me on Twitter. There's a, I can't say it here because it's a kind of a I try to keep this as family friendly as I possibly can. So there's a comment from uh, a person <laughs> uh, that uh, you should read on on my Twitter account. And I was like, well, that is what it is. I do it for the trolls. Ah, uh, that's a great question. Hey, Dan, great show. Would you recommend value averaging, similar dollar cost averaging? Uh, so yes. So you can, and I can't recommend it to you. I can only tell you what I would tell my mom. Mom, uh, let's, 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 let's break that down as the example. So zero X price. So when you dollar cost average, and, and here's the thing, you can like, so when you dollar cost average, just you pick a day or, or a time of the week or a time of the month and you go, I'm just going to put in 25 bucks or 100 or 10,000. I don't know what kind of baller you are, but whatever. So, and then you just do that th throughout an, an extended period of time. And then there's, there's another type uh, that Ben over in the Cryptoverse always talks about, which is like uh, power dollar cost averaging or accelerated dollar cost averaging as the price goes down. So let, let's like, let's say he puts a hundred bucks into zero X, which I don't think he did. So a hundred bucks into zero X. And then when it goes down a certain percentage, he's like, I'm going to add 10% more. So the next day or next week or month, it's $110. And if it goes down even more, he's like, I'm going to add another 30%. So that's 140 or whatever it is. And then he just does that until it hits a certain risk level. And he's got it all on his website. Uh, there's a link in the description. It's just app.intothecryptoverse.com. And once he hits these, these levels between a, a continuum of zero to one, he starts to sell off. So he buys as it goes down and he sells off as it comes up, but it's all about risk levels. Very basic stuff. That's dollar cost averaging. Value cost averaging is this. What if you said, and it works sometimes. So let's say right here, you have, let's say you have 10,000 bucks. You're like, I got a 10,000 bucks burning a hole in my pocket. Value cost averaging is you're not going to keep going for an extended period of time. Let's say for ten thousand dollars, you're going to put twenty five hundred bucks right off the bat, right here, and hopefully, you hit that nineteen cents. Hopefully, and then like in a couple of weeks, you put another twenty five thousand dollars in or twenty five hundred bucks in, and you do it right here. 
then maybe you hit the top 2,500 bucks. And then over here, 2,500 bucks and 2,500. So that's your 10,000 bucks and you're done. You can do that. Uh, it just depends on like, are you hitting peaks? But in all honesty, value cost averaging is fine. Just do it, mom. <laughs> mom, if you're watching, just do value cost averaging when there's a huge bear market and no one wants to buy squat. And it's a good project and you've done your, your research. And it makes the cut, like I've talked about, the cut, which is how big's the community? What's the utility? What's the team like? What have they done before? Where are they going? And how good are the tokenomics? Am I going to get dumped on? So great question. <laughs> Beardy. Beardy says, I can't get rather jump in his pool. That, you know how cold that pool is today? It's 56 degrees. I was in there this morning. It sucks. But it makes you feel good. So, yeah. Oh, let me jump back. Bridge Bridge is right. Tokenomics is the key. It's the most important thing to take a look at. That's why like I get, I don't know, 10 offers a day to, to, to cover projects. Usually I just kind of glance over them and I just delete the emails or the DMs or whatever else. I don't even look at DMs anymore. But uh, a lot of the times the projects that I bring to you are people that I've trusted and met along the way in other successful crypto projects. And those guys come to me and say, hey, we've we did this project and you were a part, thanks for being a part. We have another project. And because I trust them, then I say, okay, let me take a look at your white paper and light paper. And I'll look at that. And about, I'd say 50% of the time, I'll turn it down. Say, ah, it's, just, it's just not good enough. And then the next one, the other 50%, I'll say, yeah, it looks good. And the big thing I look at is tokenomics. If they don't have a lockup period, I won't accept it. Cause I'm like, there's no lockup period, man. Like if I get into this, I can dump on people. And if I can dump on people, which, I might, but uh, nah, I wouldn't. Um, but other people can dump on people. So you have to look at lockup periods. What's going to the VCs? What's going to the private round? How much is actually go going for staking and for exchanges and for and for future things? That's just the tokenomics part. I don't even get to give the, the, the team, the utility, and the and the community off there. Uh, this is a great question. Jeff says, Rob, are you still holding XRP? Yes, because I'm waiting for that uh, the SEC to get beat. I just hold it to support the community, honestly, but I had sold some before. We've talked about that because, I mean, it's not going to do much until after that, uh, after they win that, that lawsuit, but I think it could. Uh, oh, do you know anything about the world mobile token mainnet? I don't, I know there's already the availability for staking, which we've already done. We've actually a pool operator for a world mobile token. And I'm actually going to London May 3rd to the 7th for Coin Bureau's event. We're going to do some, I get to talk about uh, taxes and how to minimize taxes because it's not what you make, it's what you keep. So when I'm there, I'm going to meet with the World Mobile Token and some, some uh, friends I met along the way. So um, I'll ask him when I'm there. Uh, thoughts on Kandana? None. <sighs> I'm not building any metaverse stuff. Planko. But I will say this. I'll be with you guys, whatever you guys do. Uh, oh, this is a great question. Phantom Mining says, Rob, how do you feel about countries and banks starting to back the digital yuan? So here's the thing. And this was a pretty good point. Um, this was made by London, Re London Real or London Real uh, by uh, the, the, the host Rose. And he talked about, he was talking to Kitco News, Brian Rose. And he's talking to Kitco News and he said, and he asked him the same exact question. And what he said was, he said, I had Giancarlo on my show, Giancarlo Crypto Dad, uh, former head of the CFTC. And he sat him down and he said, you know what? We are close to doing a digital dollar. The question is, do people want a digital dollar? And of course, right now people are gonna say, no, we don't want that, that's nonsense. But Giancarlo said, what we're looking for is we have to do a couple of things because digital yuan is really crushing it or kicking our tail right now. So the question is, are people going to want um, censorship? 
Are they going to want tracking? Are they want to, going, to, going to want Big Brother? Or if we can create a U.S. dollar that is private, is in control of the people, and we don't track everybody, then I think it could work out okay. So people, he goes, we won't win if we do it just like the digital you want, because it's the same thing. He goes, so people are going to have to choose. Do they want censorship and Big Brother, or do they want a digital dollar going this way? And that's even a bigger question as to will they actually get the digital dollar and make it, do, make it right to where they don't shut it off because of your social score. I don't have the answers, because guess what? I'm not in those circles. So to, my, my thought is this. If you got other banks backing the digital yuan, I think in the long run that's uh, a folly, a mistake, because China controls that to the nth degree. And uh, they can shut things off and they can do whatever they want to it. And as far as like surveillance and tracking, I mean, we already know that they do a lot of that. So if they do that, that means that they become probably the next global superpower. I'll leave it at that. All right. Yeah, that's a good question. Would you ever do a video showing the difference between good and bad tokenomics? Yeah, sure. That's easy. There's a bunch of shitty tokenomics out there. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Brian Rose, yeah. And last one. Rob, can I, add, can I add additional AVEX to my Dan stake before it's maturing in August? I don't think so. I could be wrong. Uh, I'll check with the guys that help me with the staking pool. But as I understand it, you lock up your avalanche in the stake pool. We have two stake pools. We have Grano Stake Pool and Avalanche, links in the description. So we'll go from there. I would just say, if it's maturing in August, just let it go, get what you have, and then go from there. Because even if you could do it, it's not going to be, because we got, what, uh, May, June, July, three months? Nah, not so much. All right, so that's it. So look, everybody, thanks for stopping by. I do appreciate it. If you liked today's video, give it a thumbs up, and uh, consider subscribe. Do this every single day. Try to give you the best information with the most balance. Thanks so much for stopping by. I appreciate it. I'll see you on the next one. Adios.